Thanks, everyone. So uh, welcome, everybody. It's great to see so many people here. Um, some people I know quite well, others I don't know at all. But it's really great to have such a, a wonderful group of people here for these two inaugural lectures. I think uh, those of us who've been through this process and those still to come will remember it as a, a very special time. It's the most perhaps unusual lecture that one ever gives in front of one's family, friends, colleagues, and a great celebration of academic achievement. So. My warm congratulations to our two new professors this evening. And um, with one of my other university hats on as lead for Athena Swan activity across the university, that's the activity, the national activity for gender equality. It is fantastic to come to two inaugural lectures given by two senior female members of the education department. Delighted to be here, and I'm sure we all join in that uh, celebratory element. So uh, groundbreaking academic work, that's what we're going to hear about, and that's what the Department of Education does. It was one of the founding departments here at York in the university that was established in 1963. And I think from the start, although I wasn't here, but others here um, probably were, from the start, the department has pursued a dual commitment to understanding and improving learning through world-leading research in education outstanding teaching and teacher training and curriculum development with global impact. And if you see some of the work that comes out of this department, you absolutely know that those um, initial uh, really uh, features of the department are still being maintained now 50 something years on. So um, it's evidence in many ways of success, not least because the department's grown so much in size over the last 12 years. I've been told it's been, it's trebled in size and Paul will be able to uh, give that as a, as a strong evidence, I think. So um, the department's activities are underpinned by strong values, those of academic freedom and rigor, social justice, equality and diversity. Those are strong issues for the department, strong values and underpin the university values of academic excellence, equality and opportunity for all. And I think York really embodies those um, underlying values. The department is strongly committed to education as a public good and a transformative personal and social activity. It's characterised by a warmly inclusive, collaborative approach in which students are highly respected as co-constructors of knowledge and teaching and research staff work closely with professional services staff in the department as well as colleagues across the university. So the department obviously, and many of you will know, performs very well in a range of external indicators, often being ranked in the top 10 department, um, departments of education in the UK for its research and teaching. And it was in the top 10 for four star world leading research in the last research excellence framework in 2014. And I know I'm very good evidence that uh, the department is looking to do even better in 2020, and I wish you all good fortune in reaching those dizzy heights. So uh, research in the department is focused on four main areas, education and social justice, language learning, psychology in education, and science education. And our two new professors this evening are representing two of those centres of excellence, Emma is based in the Centre for Research on Language Learning and Usage, and Sophie in the Psychology Education Research Centre. So the format for this evening includes a formal introduction for both of our new professors, and following each lecture there will be opportunities for questions from the floor and some discussion, so we can join in the debate. You're then all invited to a celebratory drinks reception in the foyer afterwards, and we do hope that you'll all stay and join us and join in the conversation and meet other people. So, without further delay, uh, I'm delighted to ask Professor Roz Mitchell, Emeritus Professor of Applied Linguistics in Modern Languages and Linguistics at the University of Southampton, to say a few words to introduce our new professor, Professor Emma Marsden. Roz. Thank you very much, Deborah. I'm delighted to be in York again. I have visited York from time to time over the years, uh, rightly so, because York has a very long and distinguished tradition in languages education, dating right back to the early years of the university and the Language Teaching Centre, when the team led by Professor Eric Hawkins and his colleagues were very instrumental in promoting and developing the teaching of languages for all at all levels of the new comprehensive school system. So York has a very honourable tradition uh, in this field and it's really great to see how this tradition is being renewed and carried on today by such outstanding scholars as Emma. 
I knew Emma first at Southampton, where she did her postgraduate studies. Uh, her academic ability struck us immediately, but also her independence of thinking, against my advice a bit. Emma did a very ambitious PhD project, a classroom experiment. I was worried, you know, can she do it? It's, uh, will she get meaningful results uh, with a tricky research design? But of course, Emma being Emma, the study was meticulously carried out and very successful, did indeed produce interpretable results, and in fact led swiftly to one of Emma's very first academic publications in one of the most eminent journals there is in our field, that is to say the journal Language Learning, which uh, I'm happy to say Emma is of course now the incoming editor. Uh, she's the incoming editor for that journal starting this year. So um, Southampton started her off on a train of research which Emma has actually stuck to in her personal research. She's very concerned with and interested in the learning of grammar in a second language, particularly among classroom learners. How do classroom learners figure out the different grammar, the new grammar that they're hearing in the foreign language input around them? And, and not least, what kinds of teaching practices can support them in extracting grammar out of that input? Now, this is both a, a fundamental question in second language acquisition research, but also, of course, it has great practical implications for language pedagogy. And Emma has pursued that different aspects of that problem, of that question, with great per persistence and originality ever since that time. But she hasn't been content just to be one of those very focused researchers that uh, Paul and myself were speaking about before the meeting, because Emma also, well, I'd like to think Southampton again played a small part in this. Uh, when at Southampton, Emma joined in our research projects, we were very interested in the time, at, the, at that time in data sharing. How could we make the data we had collected about early language learning available to other researchers to use? Well, Emma took that idea of openness, connected it up with the broader open science movement that's current in many disciplines now and has been a great advocate of open science, of transparency and of the, their merits in driving up standards in language learning research and in applied linguistics research ever since. She has initiated a major project which has forwarded that goal, the IRIS project, which is, allows researchers to contribute the questionnaires they've written, the language tests they've written, all the instruments they have created to study language learning. We can now deposit those in this IRIS repository, managed, invented, thought up, created and managed by Emma, and, and researchers can access and share those instruments. And again, you see the principle of openness and sharing, which uh, must improve standards across and, 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 and common understandings of the problems we're working on in our discipline. So um, she also has clearly a major commitment to education, and we're going to hear more about this uh, bridging the gap from Emma herself this afternoon. So I'll quickly mention just two things. One is her wish to make research publications, published research, available to wider publics and in particular to teachers. And another of Emma's great projects, again, with good funding secured to support it, is the OASIS project, which allows, uh, which is now supported by many major public publishing outlets and journals in our field. Uh, where authors produce, as well as their academic article with long words and uh, lots of tables and hidden behind paywalls, as well as those, we now uh, we are expected to write plain language summaries of our research, which, we, which the journals have agreed will be made publicly available through the OASIS project. Uh, finally, Emma, of course, has... Um, played a major a key role and a developing role in government advice, uh, in advising DFEE on uh, research-based uh, practices in foreign language education, and this has culminated now in the major Centre for Excellence in Modern Foreign Language Pedagogy, the flagship DFE project 
in foreign language education at the moment in the country, which is led, uh, led by Emma and located here in York. So congratulations on all of this, contributions to the international field of second language acquisition research and language learning research, but also to UK policy and practice and the commitment to bridging the gap between uh, research and practice, which we're going to hear more about. I could say a lot of nice personal things about Emma, but I think it's more important that she gets the time, so I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you so much. I hope to live up to that now. Um, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for the warm words and thank you for the fantastic beginning I had in Southampton. So, in 1976, when I was four and I began school, Prime Minister Callaghan was talking about one core national school curriculum, eventually implemented in 1988 and this caused a sensation because up until that moment, government had not really meddled with, influenced to a great extent, the school curriculum. In 1988, I was in the first cohort of GCSEs, which eliminated a formalised distinction between O-level exams, which for foreign languages had privileged translation and grammar, and the CSE exam, which had included tests in listening and speaking. In 1992, language study was made obligatory for all children aged 11 to 13. When I became head of Spanish in a school in 1996, a foreign language became compulsory up until the age of 16. And at one point, up to 80% of pupils nationally were entered for a modern foreign language GCSE. And this national policy lasted for eight years. In 2015, my youngest daughter entered the cohort of primary school children her, uh, for whom language was compulsory for the first time in England. In 2016, I provided evidence for a national report on foreign language pedagogy in England, and my eldest daughter started a new kind of GCSE that reintroduced translation and grammar in the tests. In 2018, a few months after I'd heard I was going to be made a professor, the government announced their intention to invest in, a foreign, in foreign language pedagogy, and this was awarded to York in December last year. And now, here I am, giving an inaugural lecture on education in the main European languages in an era of uncertain times with Europe. The point being, my journey in foreign language education has been punctuated by our mixed attempts to open up more people to foreign languages trade and cultures. I now find myself in a position to shape one of these turning points and I'm immensely grateful to York, to my colleagues, students, friends and family for supporting this. I'm using this talk as an opportunity to situate my research within this wider picture. First I will describe the problems that I've tried to address and then present two examples of the kinds of studies I've done and then finally describe how these are playing out in the National Centre for Excellence for Language Pedagogy, NSELP for short. Okay, so this is the question I aim to address today. To what extent can research, my research, inform foreign language pedagogy? That is, what we teach and how we teach. And how can my research inform pedagogy? And the specific problem is whether and how to teach grammar in foreign language and particularly in the early stages, because, as Sophie is going to explain, this is most challenging because this is when learners with a very wide range of individual differences embark on a foreign language. But why is there any debate at all about whether and how to teach a foreign language grammar? First, it is extremely difficult to teach a natural human grammar with so little time available. Let me put foreign language education in England in perspective. According to some estimates, infants have about 17,500 hours of exposure to language by the age of four. They hear between two to 15,000 uh, words a day, and they arrive at primary school with several thousand words in their heard and spoken vocabulary, ready to link that sound system with the written word. In foreign language education, between 11 to 16 years, we give about 430 hours of instruction, possibly 80, if, uh, plus 80 if you're lucky at primary school, 
and we can learn between four to ten hours, uh, four to ten words in an hour of instruction. In this time, we expect a complex grammar to have developed, around two to three thousand words to be known, and a new set of sound spelling relations. Eric Hawkins, as we've just heard, the founder of the first language centre here at the university, described this situation as gardening in a gale. As a result, I've come to accept over my 20 or so years of teaching, researching, working with teachers and policymakers that we can rely very little on the implicit learning mechanisms that infants use. Given that, and this bit's critical, given that we have to work within the current examination system, which requires a large body of accurate language to be learnt in a short amount of time. But under these circumstances, it's not yet clear whether all learners can develop a creative grammar system. A second reason for this grammar debate is that many agree that the reason why we teach a foreign language is to, of course, express self-identity, understand culture, communicate, all of which are thought to require complex grammar. A quick way of achieving these aims has been by asking pupils to rote learn a large bank of prefabricated phrases without always helping them to unpick the components of these phrases. Third, some, some perspectives on language teaching have perhaps wrongly been interpreted as a need to hide a thread, a spine of vocabulary and, and grammar progression. And this has resulted in a strong tendency to sequence content around topics and functions, such as expressing opinions or planning one's future. A fourth reason is that findings from peer-reviewed research on grammar pedagogy have been very difficult to access for many reasons. But there are now hundreds of studies that could inform our thinking about what and how to teach grammar. Fifthly, perhaps related to this lack of access to research, is that there has been a lack of centralised policy and teacher education on grammar pedagogy. Dobson's review of the recent history of foreign language education came to the same conclusion. Many teachers tend to be uncertain about the place of grammar and its relationship to communication. Teachers' insecurity and confusion about grammar teaching led to them adopting diverse and idiosyncratic policy interpretations and practices. So, to illustrate this mix of practices that we see, I turn to anecdote. But I think that many of you will recognise these examples in your children's school bags. This is an extract from some homework that a year seven child, age 12, after about 43 hours of French teaching, brought home. Pupils were shown these two written sentences with open slots for a name and a number of years. Then they were told, this means my best friend is called X. I have known her for Y years. Write it down and learn it with the other phrases for the test next week. Now, this is complex. We have gender agreement on possessive pronouns, a reflexive verb, a preverbal feminine object pronoun, an irregular verb ending, and a complex temporal adverb, to name but a few. Now, of course, teaching some prefabricated phrases is, such as these can be useful. I would like to. How old are you? This smooths the way into communication, and analytic learners with good memories can break these down and reuse the parts. But this takes time, and it's easier for some learners than others. For example, in this instance, I, understood, I understand that no one asked, what would happen to the language if my best friend was a boy? <laughs> Maybe one did. Let's look at a textbook. Learners have to read the text with colour that you see here. And then they answer the questions. You can pick out the answers without too much problem. When, we're asked, well, look for the word that's related to time. Sandy, Saturday. What's your favourite animal? 
find animal préféré and elephant. But this unit in the textbook was actually trying to teach the past tense. And the next thing that learners had to do after this was to write a passage in the perfect tense, even though this exercise clearly does not focus their attention on that. But of course, teachers don't just rely on textbooks. Here's an extra handout about Spanish words for a, the, and some. This explanation introduces a lot. Don't try and read it. <laughs> it does not explain the most important and, in my view, the loveliest pattern of all, that in Spanish you can usually tell the gender of a noun by the ending, if it ends in o, masculine, a, feminine. Now, the next thing they had to do was to produce these articles. They didn't know what the nouns meant, and most of these are irregular. There's no way of knowing what the gender is. If an, analytic, if an analytical learner had tried to pick out a pattern, attempts to pick out that pattern would soon be abandoned. These are irregulars. Now, looking back to when I was teaching, using very similar resources to these, I felt lost. I didn't understand why we were doing what we were doing. I had no sense of progression of the vocabulary or the grammar that we were teaching. So what did I leave teaching to do? I've embarked on a series of studies in collaboration with many wonderful students and colleagues, many of whom are here now. They have generally taken the form of small-scale controlled experiments. And here's their basic design. This is what was making Ros nervous, I think, <laughs> in my PhD. Here's their basic design. So um, we select a predefined uh, set of learners and we give them some baseline tests across a battery of measures and then we randomly allocate them to different conditions. In my case, we would randomly allocate them to attending to and understanding the grammar in the input, i.e. in listening and reading, uh, to hearing the same grammar but do something else with the input instead, or only do the tests, a control group, and then give them post-tests immediately after the teaching, and then delay, delay post-tests a while afterwards. Why? Uh, well, I wanted to know to what extent you can learn a grammar, pick up a grammar in a new language, and do something more interesting, I know, more interesting than grammar, <laughs> more interesting grammar at the same time. Just like we saw in those listening and reading activities just now. Okay, so going back to my PhD, I set out to teach a small system of French verb endings. This was for 13 to 14-year-olds in two secondary schools with about 28 pupils in each condition. In the first condition, pupils had repeated, had repeated practice like this. You will, of course, know that this little morpheme here, A, means the action's done and complete. And without such a morpheme, this means that an action is happening now or happens regularly. So here, they had to understand the grammar in order to do the activity. In the other condition, pupils were exposed to exactly the same language, but they had to do something else with the input, a bit like we saw in that French textbook example. They have to understand the meaning of other parts of the sentence, ski. Pupils in the first condition made substantial gains, in this condition on the left, made substantial gains in their verb endings, across a battery of tests. In the second condition, very few gains were made in the verb endings, then the vocabulary gains were roughly the same across both groups. Okay, the second study um, was about learning how to mark plurality using an artificial language so that everyone started from the same baseline. So participants um, heard and saw a word like syphidot. And they had to choose which picture it matched. They were told whether they were right or wrong. OK, so over time, you can see here that their attention was oriented towards the end of that word. 
they had to focus on the meaning of the ending because ek represented plurality. In the other condition, they heard exactly the same words, cipher dot, cipher deck. But in this case, their, <coughs> over time, their attention was oriented to the meaning of the stem. Learners in this condition picked up the meanings of these stems unsurprisingly. They learnt the cipher meant climbing, but they did not pick up that grammar on the end of the words. Participants in the first condition on the left <coughs> learnt that grammar system, very simple grammar system, and they also picked up the meanings of the stems. Now, this study is one of my most rarely cited studies, and it is slightly crazy. But it was fundamental for me, and looking back, I think it gave me confidence to move towards a more applied agenda. You may be asking, how does this kind of research contribute to a 2.17 million in government investment in a centre for excellence? It won't surprise you to know that my research and its associated agenda chimed with a much bigger set of external political drivers. First is the perceived language crisis in England. Declining numbers at GCSEs are influencing A-level degrees and teacher supply. Estimates are that this situation costs the UK economy 3.5% of GDP per year. You can see that we tend to bob around about 40 to 50% <coughs> of our 16-year-olds taking a language GCSE. Just one-third of our 16-year-olds get a good pass. And now, in a third of state schools, over 50% can drop a language when they are 13. Another driver that led to this investment was the social mobility agenda. Regional inequality means that, for example, 62% of pupils in London study a GCSE, 40, a language GCSE, 40% in the North East, and 29% in Middlesbrough. Socioeconomic disparity means that children taking free school meals are much less likely to study a language GCSE compared to those with less challenging socioeconomic backgrounds. The Social Mobility Plan, published by the government, specifically mentioned access to high-quality modern foreign languages subject teaching. A third external driver for this investment has been negative reports about the quality of MFL pedagogy. For example, in 2015, it was noted that achievement was not good enough in about half of the MFL classes observed. Whatever we think of school inspectors' methods or their impact on teachers, what I'm presenting here reflects or shows that what wider factors are necessary to lead to government investment in a specific curriculum area. The Modern Foreign Languages Pedagogy Review um, the report I was involved in also argued that poor pedagogy can affect motiva motivation. And indeed, several research studies have documented a link between learners' sense of achievement um, <coughs> and their sense of progression and their motivation to learn. <coughs> so, the DfE invested in a new pedagogy, building on the recommendations made in the pedagogy review. And this has enabled Rachel Hawkes and me to build an amazing team. And I thank Rachel and the NSELP team, some of whom are here, others are out in schools delivering CPD, who have taken a leap of faith, albeit one informed by research, um, to come with me on this mission. This is the network of 45 schools with about 45,000 pupils and 219 foreign language teachers. But let's put this in perspective. This is just 1.3% of state secondary schools, a drop in the ocean. So what are we doing? Well, part of pedagogy is deciding what body of knowledge we want to teach. Models of what it is to know a language, of course, include knowledge of grammar, vocabulary, and phonics, sound symbol relations, sound writing relations, circled on the left here. In the earlier stages of language learning, our resources are foregrounding this bank of knowledge to help launch and then work in tandem with this body of knowledge, the other competences circled on the right here. So, for example, 
In order to create cohesion, you can see in the right circle, um, you first need sentences to make cohere. My 15-year-old, in revising for her GCSEs, had about 20 phrases to learn for opposition relations, despite, in spite of, although contrary to, on the other hand. She knew them all, but I think she would agree that the balance of things to be learnt was probably not right. It seems that our collective attention has wandered from, or we have lost confidence in, focusing on a bank of vocabulary and a basic grammatical system, and focus too much too soon on the competencies on the right. So, NSELP's mission, we've been challenged with defining this body of knowledge, and then, critically, helping teachers to provide planned and meaningful practice of this body of knowledge. What you can see on the left here is a stylized characterization of observed pedagogy. And on the right, you can see the pedagogy that the DfE have funded us to develop and pilot. I'm circling here two elements that are outside my core area of expertise. Phonics, the sound writing relations, and vocabulary. So as you can see, this is a far cry from those kinds of controlled experiments all about grammar that I introduced earlier. And this is why we need the large team. But also, it's why we're using academic research in a way that I think is unprecedented, at least in the UK MFL scene. We are using summary research on the database that Ros talked about um, that are made available on OASIS. Holding, which is a database holding non-technical summaries of research that are openly accessible. Three journals make it obligatory to have a summary written, and many others ask or invite their authors to write summaries. We have now about 300. So, many of the resources that are on the NSELP, the Centre for Excellence database, we've got about 200 resources so far, they are linked to summaries of the relevant research. So, of course, these summaries don't provide a direct link to those specific resources, but they do provide an opportunity to reflect on some of the evidence that we're using to inform the resource creation. So, where now? Where can having one's feet in two camps lead? We are yet to know whether our work will address, in a substantial or sustainable way, the language crisis or the social mobility agenda. Let's recall that in half a century, we have moved from only about 20% of children studying a language at grammar schools at age 16, to a situation where all are entitled to do so, and about 50% do. So that's about 30% more children. But this change is largely due, due to major policy shifts. Comprehensivization in 1965, the national curriculum, and unifying the exam system. So, for our centre, NSELP, to increase GCSE uptake by 15%, which is the bar that the DfE have set us, without any macro policy changes, is challenging. <laughs> Secondly, we are yet to know whether the high-stakes GCSE exams in fact work against changing approaches to teaching. The NSELP team is now in a position to shape the exams and we are gathering evidence for this, for example, about the amount of vocabulary that's needed for the exams. Finally, my experience has shown me that there are many highly experienced practitioners who would welcome greater access to research findings, but there are still very few academic linguists who understand foreign language lang uh, pedagogy and classrooms. Collaborations with teachers are, of course, essential, but simply we need more bodies which have, who have two feet um, <laughs> in two camps, one foot in two camps. We need more such people who are, have this dual expertise. Um, yes, I'm answering the question in the title of my talk. I've had a foot in two camps, and that's been necessary. Um, and I've learned that in order to be confident about the latest research findings, um, when working at this research practice interface, that maintaining a fundamental research agenda, 
driven by learning theory, now actually feels more important. And thanks to York's support and the fantastic colleagues I am privileged to work with and the continued patience and support of family and friends, I think this is going to be just about possible. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Emma. A really excellent talk. I know, know far more than I did when I came in, which for me is always a good mark of an excellent talk. So thank you for that. We'll look forward to asking you some questions in a little while. So can we move on then without any further delay? And I'm delighted to ask um, Professor Robert Plomin, Professor of Behavioural Genetics at King's College London, to say a few words to introduce our second new Professor of the Evening, Professor Sophie von Sturm. Robert. And it's such a nice occasion. It's one of the best things that we do in academia, you know, is to um, award people, a, a, give them a chance for an inaugural lecture for the professorship. And it's especially a great pleasure for me to introduce Sophie, Professor Sophie von Stum, uh, who I think is, is really one of the brightest um, young researchers in, and actually, in what? Um, what's interesting is that uh, it's hard to say in what, because she's been employed as a personality researcher at Goldsmith, as a developmental psychologist and social psychologist at the London School of Economics, and now as an educational psychologist at York. In addition, she's an excellent statistician, and she's taken genetics and genomics in stride in the last few years. She's also interested in the effects of early life experiences on cognitive development, uh, in technologies for big data, and in the role of personality in the learning. So in this age of increasing specialization, you know, learning more, uh, more and more about less and less in a way, Professor von Stumm's interdisciplinarity is, I think, her greatest strength. She has the energy and intelligence to bring these very disparate fields together to create synergies in research. Um, she's accomplished so much, it's hard to imagine that she received her PhD only nine years ago in 2010. After her PhD, which was from Goldsmiths University of London, she began what I think must be a record for academic achievement, five posts in seven years. <laughs> she began as a senior lecturer in the Department of Psychology at the University of Chichester. After one year, she moved to the University of Edinburgh to accept an ESRC-funded postdoctoral fellowship. In 2012, she went back as a faculty member to the Department of Psychology at Goldsmiths, where she stayed for five years, her longest interlude by far. In 2017, she accepted a post um, to help set up a new psychology department at the London School of Economics, LSE. And last year, she accepted her current position as professor of psychology and education at the Department of Education here at the University of York, which is the reason for today's celebration. In what must be another record, Professor von Stumm has gotten every post for which she interviewed, including, you probably don't know, a professorship in Germany, which she turned down in order to come to York. Despite her peripatetic academic life, moving to five posts in seven years, Professor von Stumm has been a prolific scientist. She's authored more than 50 peer-reviewed journals, including 30 as first author. Three examples of her research. I was going to give you three examples of her research, but I think she'll talk about these, and I, I, I'm told that I should limit my talk to five minutes. So I, I could have told you about her interest in effects of early family environments on cognitive development and her other long-term interest in curiosity, which is where the Hungry Minds title comes from, um, including her lab. And I do think it's a, a key uh, cardinal trait of Professor von Stumm is her curiosity. That's what drives her interest in so many different things. And then the third example is new. I'm going to read this one because this is the most interesting. Although not a geneticist by training, Professor von Stumm has moved into the forefront of the DNA revolution as it sweeps into the behavioral sciences. For example, she and her team showed for the first time that intergenerational social mobility is in part influenced by genetic factors. She's begun to combine DNA with her interest in environment to study the interplay between genes and environment in development. One of her most recent papers is called Predicting Educational Achievement from Genomic Measures, DNA, and Socioeconomic Status. It traces the influence of DNA and SES and their interaction on educational achievement throughout the school years. Using growth curve models, an example of her statistical expertise, she showed that DNA and SES independently predict educational achievement in the first year of school 
and they also account for systematic changes in achievement across the school years. So I think that's going to be a particularly important paper. Professor von Stumm has an excellent track record as seen in terms of the standard criteria of grants, awards, and leadership. For example, she's received grants from, this is a long list, I'll, I'll skim some of it, European Foundation for Alcohol Research, the Royal Society, the Jacobs Foundation, the British Academy, the Lieberhume Foundation, and the Wellcome Trust. She also has several awards for her research, such as the Rising Star Award from the American Psychological Association, the Ex Excellence in Research Award from the Mensa Foundation, and the Early Career, I know, it's great, isn't it? <laughs> and the Early Career Award from the International Society for the Study of Individual Differences. How about that? <laughs> She's also on the editorial board of several journals and, uh, journals and an associate editor of two journals. Now, another sign of her acknowledged leadership in the field and this is a quite amazing at her um, relatively early stage in, in uh, her career, is she's a grant review panel member for the ESRC, which awards many research grants in the social sciences in the UK. And given her interdisciplinary interest, she's also a panel member of the Interdisciplinary Research Advisory Panel for REF 2021. This is, for those of you who don't know, a UK program that evaluates universities and determines the money they receive. So it's very important. She's also a consultant for several organizations such as Merck, Mind Gym UK, and Save the Children. Um, as, as I'm sure people in this department have begun to um, realize, Professor von Stumm is a terrific colleague, energetic, full of ideas, and fun. She's also extremely well organized, efficient, and effective, which I fear puts her at risk for uh, administrative work. And I think anything that takes her away, this is for Paul, <laughs> anything that takes her away from her research is a mistake because she's one of the brightest and most creative researchers I know. I hope her move to York will allow her to settle down from her itinerant academic life. And I predict that uh, she no longer will be a rising star. I predict that her star will have risen so high in the sky over York, you can see it around the world. So please join me in congratulating Professor von Stumm and welcoming her inaugural lecture. Thank you so much. Uh, for these very kind and very generous words. <clears throat> um, research is me-search, as they say. And uh, today is a unique opportunity for me um, to describe the peculiar events that have led to me standing here today in front of you as a professor of psychology in education. Um, in September in 1986, I was three and a half years old, and I had my first day at kindergarten. And that was the single most dramatic experience of my life <laughs> up to that point, but it still haunts me until today. It's not that the kindergarten was particularly unusual. Uh, we were about 30 Bavarian children, and to relive the moment some people are in Bavarian outfits today. Um, uh, between the ages of three and six years, and uh, we had a large room with lots of toys, and we had a big garden with a sandbox out at the back. And I was familiar with toys and with sandboxes, uh, but I had never before met 29 other children. Uh, children who were of my age, who spoke my language, and who actually lived only a few streets from my own house. And yet, they were fundamentally different to me. Um, they didn't say or think or do the same things as I did. Uh, we all faced the same challenge, to entertain ourselves as best as possible during the kindergarten hours. But our approaches were so different. Uh, some kids would uh, build sand castles outside. Some kids would draw pictures inside. Uh, some kids would chase other kids around the playground. Um, I had my way of dealing with the situation. I, um, I preferred assisting the kindergarten staff. <laughs> I insisted on walking hand in hand with a kindergarten carer, um, and I would share my observations about the other kids' behavior uh, in serious conversations. And so you might think, I, quite rightly so, I was a born psychologist. Um, the observation that children differ, I got to confirm that at every level of education that I've reached, from primary school through to my PhD cohort, um, and today, Perhaps not surprising, it is my program of research. So the essence of individual differences research is trying to understand how and why we are so different. 
and differences between us are most obvious when they're in our physical traits. So some of us are blonde, some of us are brunette, some are tall, some are short, uh, we have different builds, we have different eye color. Um, but we also differ in our psychological makeup. Uh, some of us are happier than others, some of us are more confident than others, some of us are cleverer than others. I'm particularly interested in individual differences in the ability to learn. Um, that is, to meet challenges, to master them, and to learn from the experience. In our society, learning challenges tend to come in the form of information processing tasks, like reading, writing, and arithmetic. And we learn these skills in school. And I study children's differences in school performance because school serves two very important functions. The first one is to equip us with the knowledge and the skills that are essential for us to successfully participate in society. But the second function is a gatekeeper to regulate the access to higher education or further educational qualifications. And further educational qualifications, like doing a degree, are on average associated with better life outcomes. People who have more education tend to live in bigger and nicer houses in better areas. They tend to earn more money. Um, they tend to live longer. They tend to live healthier. And um, uh, so I started to think about what predicts people's differences in learning, what predicts differences in the accumulation of knowledge, and that was during my PhD. Um, I designed this conceptual model, which I'm very fond of, but uh, nobody wanted to publish it until today. So I'm trying to promote it here in the hope somebody will, will offer me an opportunity. And it was the attempt to combine the two key factors that influence learning, um, our cognitive abilities, um, our talents to learn, and then the personality traits that describe our tendency of how we approach learning in principle. And I think the two have an interplay between one another there are behavioral mechanisms that we can identify that link them, and they inform gains in our information processing capacity and ultimately gains in our knowledge. Now, I call this the hungry mind, and I like the name so much, I called my lab the same way. It's the hungry mind lab, and what we're trying to do is understand parts of this model to bring them together to an understanding of what is cognitive development and what are individual differences in cognitive development. When I started out, I was particularly interested in the personality part of things. And like every good PhD student, I reviewed the entire literature that's out there on personality traits that might be associated with learning. And through this very long and painful process that every PhD student should go through nonetheless, um, I came to the conclusion that there are two key personality domains that we should consider when we try to understand learning outcome differences. The first one is intellectual curiosity. You might want to think about it as the hunger for knowledge. It describes a tendency to engage in abstract thinking, to seek out information, to engage in learning opportunities and in intellectual pursuits when they present themselves. The second domain is openness. You might want to think about that as the hunger for experience. Um, it's the idea that uh, we, are, uh, we have a preference for the new and different in many aspects of life. For example, you might want to try different foods, you might want to travel to different countries and experience their culture, or you might want to immerse yourself in different forms of art, and that is openness to experience. And what I was interested in is which of these two predicts the accumulation of knowledge. And we've done many studies on that in my lab, but I just wanted to show you three to give you a flavor of the kind of odd things that we ask participants to do. So here's the first one where we presented our participants with a website on an area of outstanding beauty that they were unlikely to know because it is actually you know, an area. <laughs> it's um, in Croatia. These are the Plitvice lakes. It's a beautiful waterfall area. And we asked our participants to just look at this website as they felt about it. Like we didn't force them to do anything. But at the end, we surprised them with a little exam on it and said, how much did you actually take away from the information? Um, in a second study, we were a little more serious. 
So we gave our participants, we asked them to come in for three weeks. Every week we gave them a very scholarly uh, long articles, about five pages long, on serious complex topics. For example, the Cuban Missile Crisis, or CRISPR, it's a gene editing method, or the dot-com bubble. And we asked them to afterwards pass an exam. So this time they were instructed. They knew the exam was coming. It's a very hard multiple choice test. And we promised them a lot of money if they got it right to really incentivize them to study hard. Um, and we did uh, something a little more simple where we presented people with little trivia facts. Um, this one was about sign language. And we let them read those trivia statements. And afterwards, we asked again, how much of the information did you retain? Does anyone know? Who first introduced sign language? You get brownie points if you give me the year on top. No preferences? Hmm. It was Juan Pablo Bonet. Anyone for the time? 1620, long time ago. Um, across all these studies, we found overwhelming consistent evidence that it is openness to experience that has the most positive, the strongest effect on the accumulation of knowledge and not intellectual curiosity. And you might think that this is counterintuitive because if you are hungry for knowledge and you want to learn and you seek out reading whenever you can, this is what should feed your knowledge primarily. Um, but I think the finding about openness is that it doesn't require you to recognize a learning opportunity as such. It doesn't need to be signposted as here is intellectual engagement on offer. But it's something we do on our day-to-day -day lives. In every ever so mundane experience, we can still something away, take something away that informs our knowledge and that helps build our capacities and our intellect. Now, this work is focused on adolescents, students, and adult populations. But more recently, I've started to think about uh, children's differences in school performance. Because the fascinating thing about that is that children differ enormously in their abilities to learn already in primary school, and we can see that very clearly. But the second point is that these differences are highly stable. So children who struggle in the first year of primary school relative to their other students will also struggle relative to the other students by the end of primary school. It's a very stable difference. And so the question I've been thinking about is what happens to us before we enter school that has such a pervasive influence that it drives differences in school performance when we start and makes them stable throughout? Well, what happens is your family, where you come from, your people. Um, they inform the environment that you grow up in, and they, with that, they influence, to a certain extent, how you will develop cognitively. And a few years ago, I could demonstrate that effect, that relationship between ba family background and cognitive development in a large cohort study. And what you see here is children who've been assessed on their cognitive development from the age of two through to 16 years, and uh, for the ease of interpretation, cognitive ability or cognitive development here is shown in terms of IQ points, because IQ is normed at 100 with a standard deviation of 15. And what you see, um, the lines represent are different levels of socioeconomic status. So that is basically different levels of families of their access to resources in society. And you can see very clearly, the, the graph is split into boys and girls, very classic, blue and red. We like it, simple here. Um, and you have differences at the, at the age of two that are systematically associated with family background in a magnitude of about five IQ points. By the age of 16, that has magnified, it has in fact tripled. It's about one standard deviation difference that separates the children in the lowest SES group from those in the highest SES group in cognitive development. Now, my next question was, what drives this? What happens in these families? What creates those differences? And we've studied many different factors in my lab. We looked at food, the types of meals that families prepare for their children. And yes, people from more or families of more deprived backgrounds tend to feed their children more often prefabricated meals. And that has an effect on cognitive development. We looked at language environment, 
the way that parents speak to their children and how they then pick up language as a result. And my amazing PhD student is hiding somewhere in the room. Where is she hiding? Down there, yes, I see you, who led the work on, on the language environment. But the, the aspect that I want to talk about today, and Robert has hinted at that, is DNA. Because our parents don't only give us the house we grow up in and the environment that they provide for us, but they pass on DNA differences that we inherit. And we have to make do with what we get, or maybe not. Um, we shall see. So how is this that we can look at DNA today? It's something that's only become possible over the past 15 years through something that's called a genome-wide association study. And genome-wide association studies help us to test for DNA variants that we carry in our genome and their association with a trait that we are interested in. So here we are interested in traits related to learning ability. And what you see in the graph is uh, the, the genome according to chromosomes. And you see little spikes here that indicate the extent to which a DNA variant is associated with the trait that we're looking at. Now, the main lesson that we learned from genome-wide association studies is that there's not one gene or two genes for learning or even 100, but it's many thousands of genetic factors with very small effect sizes. So what do you do with this information? You can't, you can't split people into groups saying smart genes, not so smart genes, let's see what happens next. Because it is such a complex mess of genetic factors that go together. So what we've learned that we can do is we can just add them all together in individuals. So for any person where you have genotype data, you can use the information that you've taken from a genome-wide association study and then add their DNA points together and you get a person-specific estimate of their genetic propensity for, in our case, the ability to learn. Now the question is, does this work? If we have a sample with a lot of DNA and we calculate these points, does it predict something that's associated with learning outcomes? Mm -hmm, it does. So here is a study we did very recently. Um, this is based on about 10,000 children who had their GCSEs taken at age 16 which in Britain at the time marked the end of compulsory schooling, and we have their genome-wide polygenic scores. What you see is the sample split into deciles. So you have the lowest scoring 10% on genome-wide polygenic scores here, and the highest 10% there. And on the y-axis, you have GCSE scores or grades. So what you can see is that there's a linear relationship between people's genetic propensity for learning and the school grades that they actually earn. Um, I'll translate this into an effect size for you. In the lowest decile, on average, students get a C um, in their GCSEs. In the highest decile, that's an A minus. Now, I hope you can also see the many dots that are around the little boxes that go, you, that, that go to show that this is not a 100% foolproof association. There's a lot of people who score lower or higher on both dimensions and don't really fall exactly on the regression line. But as I'm spending my time with this sort of work and I'm thinking about uh, the predictive validity of genetic factors and how uh, informative this might be for our actual outcomes, um, I thought in honor of this lecture and in order to contribute positively to science overall, I could look at my own genome and I could get some genome-wide polygenic scores for myself and see how that plays out against the things that we know about me. Um, and so I thought we start with a simple one, which is height. Height is highly heritable, and we've been able to identify many genetic markers that predict height, so the score should be relatively good. Um, this is genetically where I am. I am at the 85th, 86th percentile for height. Um, I don't know if you can tell. Uh, how tall I actually am. I'm 173 centimeters, and I don't know the English system, so we'll have to leave it at that. But I, I, it, it just inspired me to look up how tall I am relative to the population, and there's amazing data on that out on the internet. So I can look up my birth year, my nationality, and then how tall the average person would have been, and I get a standard deviation, and it turns out that I score at the 84th percentile phenotypically for height. So we can say this genome-wide polygenic score thing is going well so far, right? Yeah. Okay, another one is smoking. Have you ever smoked? Some of you will know the answer to this already, 
but genetically I'm here with a slight above average tendency for smoking or genetic risk for smoking. And um, I tried uh, to find proof for my former sinful life. I don't do it anymore, but uh, there you are. Yes, I used to smoke. <laughs> so again, the genome-wide polygenics course matched my phenotypic development. Um, and now here's the one we've all been waiting for, <laughs> right? Given the talk and the topic and challenges. Um, this is where I score genetically. I'm at the 37th percentile. And you see the line here. This is, would be the average. So I'm scoring below average. And so far, that didn't make, concern me at all, because who knows where the other professors in this country score, right? <laughs> I mean, what is, what is the IQ of, uh, of the average professor? And it turns out there is data on that and speculations. And I did look that up. So apparently, uh, professors score, on average, on a 99.6 percentile, which is up here. So uh, I am a long way away from that. <laughs> and so does that mean this is all a big mistake? I should be on that side of the theater, and someone else should be here. Uh, and I think the answer is no. Um, it just means that it potentially took a lot of support to carry me over to the professorial finishing line. And I had support in many forms. I had support from brilliant minds in individual differences research, uh, starting with Ian Deary, who supervised my master's studies in Edinburgh. And then I did my PhD with Tomas Chamorro Pramutsig and Adrian Furnham in London. Um, my thinking about the hungry mind uh, was, was very much inspired by Phil Ackerman, who's at Georgia Tech. Um, and my turn uh, to genetics is thanks to Robert Plowman, who convinced me somehow that uh, genetics is almost as interesting as curiosity as a subject of research. Um, but I also had your support, the support of this wonderful institution um, that has welcomed me so warmly with such enthusiasm and interest in my work. Um, and I know it's early days because I just moved here in January, but I cannot imagine a better place to work and live. I am totally in love with York University and city, and it's really fantastic to have this opportunity here. My greatest thanks, uh, of course, have to go to my family. Um, my wonderful parents, who um, didn't only pass on their genes to me, um, but they also had an infallible talent for spotting my academic deficits before I did, and uh, uh, sent me early on to an institute to treat my dyscalculia. I was there for three years. I would not have made A-levels otherwise. Um, and they advised me correctly where to find a place to study psychology without meeting the numerus clausus, which is the entry criteria to university in Germany. Again, I didn't quite cut the bar. Um, I have a wonderful big family with lots of uncles and aunts, who, uh, many of whom are here today. And they instilled a very firm sense of security in me early on. Um, and let me know always that if I needed help, they were there to give it. And I have made great use of that in the past, and I will reserve the right for the future. Um, but the absolute uh, deepest thanks uh, that I have at this moment is for three amazing women in my life who um, have helped me to be here today. My little sister, Maria, who um, <laughs> spent a lot of time in Manchester Airport today as a service to this event. Um, but who also told me my first lesson in individual differences. Because even though I'm the older one, she only at occasion followed my instructions. <laughs> and I think it was all the better for us because uh, she made me successfully overcome my adolescent tardiness and got me to school on time before they actually threw me out uh, in the final year uh, of, of my education. Um, my wonderful mother, who has come around to individual differences and genetics, uh, even though she had healthy skepticism about both, and resistance. But it was that resistance and skepticism that I think made me sharpen my arguments and develop what I hope is an almost flawless program of research in both areas. And my grandmother, who I miss every day, but especially today, because she would have been incredibly proud of this, and it's a very happy occasion um, to celebrate. So, why are we so different? It's complicated. 
I cannot give you a complete answer today, but I hope you'll take away two things from this talk. One is that children differ in their ability to learn, and the other one is that family is important. Thank you. So, if that is all, I'm going to draw this part of the evening to a conclusion and pass over to Paul. But I would just say that uh, I think we've all been privileged tonight. You don't have to be an academic to have sat here tonight and have learnt new things and to realise the importance of uh, curiosity, great ideas, research, evidence, to really address some of the major issues, in this case in the education. But I think we can be confident both of you are going to make a real difference, are already making a real difference in this field. And we look forward to further great things to come to add to the reputation of education at York. We're both really pleased you're here. And many congratulations again on your elevation to the uh, professorships. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. So uh, it just falls to me now to, uh, first of all, thank you all for coming, our guests, our colleagues, uh, and particularly families and friends of our two speakers. It's delightful to see uh, so many people turning out tonight. There's just a few people that I'd like to uh, thank who've been involved in the uh, organisation of the event tonight. Uh, so first of all, thank you to Debbie, to Robert and to Roz for their uh, kind words and their uh, comparing this evening, which I think um, was, was really interesting and, and helpful. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much to Emily Robinson, who has been involved in uh, helping with the slides to uh, Sophie and Sophie, so well, that's three Sophies at least, who have been working on the, uh, the microphones, the roving mics. Uh, special thanks particularly to Professor Ian Davis and to uh, Sarah Dace Hughes, who have been doing all of the work behind the scenes to make sure uh, tonight was a, a great success. Uh, I really, really appreciate uh, their work on that. And finally, uh, just to say thank you again to our two fantastic speakers what wonderful talks we've had this evening what a great and easy job i have when i have such fantastic colleagues like that uh, pushing the boundaries of knowledge we do have uh, a small token of thank you uh, thanks to both of you uh, it's not a football <laughs> and it's nothing to do with work either so uh, hopefully it will be something that you will enjoy uh, just before I ask you to uh, thank our speakers for a final time, I'd like to invite you to join us. Oh, it's gone off. I can shout. I'd like you to uh, invite you to join us all uh, in the foyer for uh, a reception afterwards. But before we do, let's say thank you once again to Emma and Sophie.